So welcome to our October installment of the Emily Dickinson Museum's reading series, Phosphorescence. To Dickinson, phosphorescence was a divine spark and the illuminating light behind learning. Dickinson's descriptions of phosphorescence reveal an understanding of its chemical volatility. For her to be phosphorescent was to be more than illuminating. It was to be transformative, even alchemical. This series of virtual readings runs monthly now through December, bringing you established and emerging poets from all over the world, working in diverse styles from a range of backgrounds, but all reading powerful poetry that contains a transformative spark. Tonight, we will hear their work and then share a conversation with them about contemporary poetry and Emily Dickinson's legacy. My name is Brooke Steinhauser. I'm the program director at the Emily Dickinson Museum, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Since we can't hear your applause tonight, we do hope you'll consider sharing words of affirmation and appreciation in the chat during the reading. And we'd love for you to start right now by telling us where it is you're tuning in from this evening or this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are. So we'll take a few minutes at the end of the program for conversation with these poets after their readings. And we hope that you'll feel free to participate by adding your questions to the chat or to the Q&A feature as we go. So you can use the chat or the Q&A to do that. The Q&A button is at the bottom of your uh, screen under your toolbar. And you can also upvote each other's questions there too, if you like. One last note is that we will be enabling Zoom's auto transcription feature this evening, which is uh, generates closed captioning to the best of a computer's ability. Um, and since this is computer generated, there could be some errors along the way in transcription. So um, you can choose to use this feature or not to use it. If you want to turn it on or off, just go to the live transcript button at the bottom of your toolbar. And this full program will last just about one hour. So we have a real treat for you this evening. We're gonna be hearing from two poets whose work draws on imagery of geography and home to explore themes of belonging and cultural identity. Both poets are also educators, academics, anthologists, and translators. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's featured poets. First, we're gonna hear from Samrita Ganguly, She's an Indian professor and award-winning poet and literary translator. She was a Fulbright doctoral research fellow at Brown University in the US and is an alumna of the Uni University of East Anglia's International Literary Translation and Creative Writing Summer School. So Marita is serving as a judge for the 2021 Penn America Translation Prize and is currently head of the Department of English at the Maharaja Manindra Chandra College at the University of Calcutta. Her work has been showcased at the London Book Fair, and she's read in cities like Bloomington, Bombay, Boston, Calcutta, Cove, and Delhi, among many others, London, Providence, the list goes on. So Rita is the editor of the first anthology of food poems, Quesadilla and Other Adventures, which came out in 2019, and has translated Fire Songs in 2019, Shakuni, Master of the Game in 2019, and The Midnight Sun, Love Lyrics and Farewell Songs in 2018, among other works. Tonight, she's coming to us live from Calcutta, India, where it is in fact three in the morning. Uh, so we want to extend a special uh, welcome to Somrita. Um, Calcutta and India is a place Dickinson never did manage to visit, um, but certainly one of the many faraway countries that she does reference in her poetry. And I'll be putting Somrita's webpage in the chat for you when she begins her reading. Then we're gonna hear from Danielle Legro george Danielle's a writer, translator, academic, and author of several books of poetry, including The Dear Remoteness of, The Dear Remote Nearness of You, winner of the New England Poetry Club's Sheila Margaret Motten Book Prize. She's a professor and a director of the Leslie University MFA program in creative writing. And she taught at the Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences Writers Workshop at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Her awards include fellowships from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Boston Foundation, and the Black Metropolis Research Consortium. She was appointed the second poet laureate of the city of Boston and served in that role from 2015 to 2019, collaborating with literary and visual artists, museums, and galleries. 
The Massachusetts Artist Leaders Coalition recognized her civic work with a Champion of Artists Award in 2017. She is the editor of City of Notions, an anthology of contemporary Boston poems. And her most recent work is a book of translations from the French, Island Heart, the poems of Ida Faubert, published by Subpress Collective this very year. Tonight, she comes to us live from Boston, Massachusetts, a place Dickinson did in fact visit a few times, most notably to receive eye surgery when she was in her twenties. Danielle, I hope that you haven't had to have any recent um, <laughs> excursions to the 19th century ophthalmologist as, as Dickinson did. Um, so I'm going to, before we um, enter into our readings, I'm gonna invite both of these poets to um, introduce themselves in their own words to greet our audience tonight. And uh, so Rita and Danielle, would you just, maybe you could tell us um, a little bit too about a current project that you're working on. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Brooke, for this introduction. Thank you to the Emily Dickinson Museum for this invitation. So Marita, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing your work and, and very happy to be sharing this space with you. Um, I, a recent project of mine um, was, or has been engendered by the images of the Haitians at the Texas border uh, about more than um, a, a month ago. And um, being of Haitian descent, I was very um, struck and moved and disturbed by those images and began uh, thinking about uh, questions of citizenship and statelessness and definition of uh, refugee. Uh, and so I began to write some poems in response to, to those images and, and, and then began to and then that project just sort of expanded a little bit. So that's that's a very recent project of mine. Hello, everyone. Um, so good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, which part of the world you're joining in from. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, thank you, Brooke, and um, everyone at the Emily Dickinson Museum for the work you're doing, um, and especially for this very phosphorescent series. Um, absolutely honored to share this space with Danielle with today. Um, looking forward to hearing you, uh, Danielle. Um, I'm currently working on um, a book of poems called um, The Architecture of Dreams. And I will probably read a couple of works from there. Uh, besides that, I'm working on um, several literary translation projects. Um, you know, um, I like to think of poetry as the sun, which is to say that it's, it's everywhere and it's for everyone. And uh, which is also why I think of my work as, um, as a literary translator as an attempt to carry some of the warmth of the sun to places where it might not otherwise reach. Um, I think I'm a very um, reluctant poet, a sort of a hesitant one, a shy one. If you were to ask me why I write, I don't think I'd be able to give you an answer. Um, you know, it's like asking me why I love a person. Sure, there are reasons, but I think the more I try to put it in words, ironically, uh, the more confusing it gets. Um, you know, I could say he likes wearing knitted socks and so do I, he likes shrimps, so do I, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it's easy to say why, it's easy to explain. Um, but for me, uh, poetry, writing for that matter, is a very visceral experience. I, you know, to use words we've all heard before, it's therapeutic, it's cathartic. I write when I can't hold these words in me any longer. I'm choking on them and I hope I'll be able to share some of that um, madness, what we call Janun in Urdu, Fitur, some of that madness with you this night. Thank you. Thank you both for those wonderful introductions. And um, so Rita, would you, would you take, take it away with the madness? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it is, as Brooke mentioned, it is um, three in the morning where I am. And at three in the morning, as one of my favorite writers, um, 
has said, uh, Fitzgerald, he said, um, at three in the morning, a forgotten package has the same tragic importance as a death sentence. And in a real dark night of the soul, it is always three in the morning, day after day. So I want to begin our 3 a.m. musings uh, today by reading to you one of my favorite works by Emily Dickinson. Mm. This is number 591 from her complete works. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry and breaths were gathering firm for that last onset when the king be witness in the room. I willed my keepsakes, signed away what portion of me be assignable. And then it was there interposed a fly with blue uncertain stumbling buzz between the light and me. And then the windows failed and then I could not see. Um, Death, as we know, anybody that's followed um, Dickinson's career, it's probably one of her favorite thematic grounds. Um, but in this poem, yeah, I, I think there's something especially stirring, especially raw, um, because the speaker here does not refer to death as a metaphor or um, a transcendental spiritual experience. The speaker is, after all, a corpse, talking about uh, the series of unimportant details that follow death, the buzzing of the fly, the still stubborn air, a corpse lying in wait. And um, I am currently located in a place which has um, by several people been described as a corpse lying in wait. I'm in, I'm in Calcutta, I was born here and I returned to the city after a hiatus of um, nearly a decade. My friend Philippe, about whom I will read um, shortly, um, you know, he had once told me that Calcutta is this city that has been dying for years, yet it is never quite dead. So I would like to read to you next um, excerpts from a long narrative poem uh, that I wrote about this dying yet not quite dead city, Calcutta. And perhaps if you uh, close your eyes, you'll be able to see her undead at 300. This one is called Calcutta, a phenotype. It's a, it's a sort of love letter that I never posted. Calcutta, a phenotype. Calcutta reminds me of Trieste, Philippe had once told me. A beautiful, rich, old woman, now forgotten and lonely. Philippe first came to Calcutta the year in which I was born. We did not know back then that nearly three decades later, we would be walking down the crowded cobbled streets of Mina Bazaar in the stale, ancient, moth-eaten city of Delhi under twilight skies that change colors like old lovers do, talking about his exhilaration on sighting the port of Calcutta and my solace on seeing the last of this land disappear behind the clouds. Philippe had come to Calcutta from France via Vietnam in 1990. I was headed to New York City via Hong Kong in 2009. Trieste was the main harbor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Philippe had said one evening in 2017. It was a large empire sprawling all over Central Europe, but its access to the sea was limited. Trieste was a sea city and the only big harbor in this aging empire. This made Trieste powerful and rich, much more than the size of the city betrays. And it was very cosmopolitan for its dimensions. Then the empire collapsed after the First World War and Trieste ended up being a part of Italy on the Western Front. But for most of the century, the city was just the Iron Curtain separating Western from communist Europe. 
But when you visit the city now, you feel that once upon a time, it must have been a thriving center of power and activity. She's still rich, but very, very quiet. You talk like someone from a dream, I had replied to Philip, thinking about the colonial past of my birthplace, about Job Charnock and Charles Eyer, choosing Calcutta over all other places about the Portuguese and Armenian and British mariners who had once called this distant alien land Golgotha. From where, some say, my city got its name, Calcutta. But who had sailed to its perilous shores in the 17th century nonetheless? You talk like someone from a dream and for a moment, you made me feel sad for Trieste, as though she were a real person. I think I will die like Trieste, rich, alone, forgotten. Rich, alone, forgotten, and beautiful. Because Trieste is beautiful like Calcutta, Philippe had reassured me. Calcutta knows about all my firsts. The first stolen D.H. Lawrence, read under the torchlight of a Nokia 1200 mobile phone, way past bedtime. The first time the engine of a car revved to life under my unsteady hands. The first time a beagle licked my fingers. The first time I bought a cigarette, armed with zero experience and quixotic notions of adulthood. My friend and I, all of 18, had walked for two kilometers after college to a fairly desolate area that day. We fumbled and faltered while asking the wayside Panwala for a, a Marlboro. It was the only name both of us knew back then. After that adult purchase, we went from free school street lined with old books and gramophone records looking for a suitable hideout. Eventually, we reached the sanctum sanctorum of Hogs Market, which swallows people into its great bowels with overpowering stenches of barrels of unsold pig's cheeks dumped behind shops which had spotlessly clean front doors. We took shelter in an abandoned church on Sutter Street at last to hide from the rain and our shame of not having found a corner of space where we could experience our Greek passage. No matter where you go in Calcutta, curious eyes will be your constant companions. The cigarette had gone soggy in the back pocket of my skin-tight denims, a symbol of our aborted, orchestrated plan of growing wings like butterflies tired of our caterpillar lives. We took a Kali Pili taxi back home, the second best adult thing to do in Calcutta in 2008, our lips tasting of pomegranate lip balms where they should have, could have, tasted of burnt tobacco. The ambassador taxi with its galloping meter drove us from Park Street via Esplanade to Tireti Bazar and finally to Ahiritola. My friend, Madhubi, stayed in an old North Calcutta house in those days. She lives in Bombay now. She quickly disappeared behind the anonymity that the crumbling edifices of Calcutta 700-005 can offer. Anyone can come to Calcutta from anywhere and melt into the city. On hot summer afternoons, the lanes and by lanes of North Calcutta sleep, like the owners of the red brick buildings situated there. At other times of the day and the year, these lanes are abuzz with children playing gully cricket, hand-drawn rickshaws, fresh markets, pharmacies, many pharmacies well-stocked on antacids, confectionaries selling hot, spongy, syrupy, sweet roshagollas, and frying radha bolrubis in cauldrons full of spluttering mustard oil, barking stray dogs, Women wearing baggy maxis or loose nighties screaming obscenities in jest at each other across courtyards. Superannuated men sitting on charpoys playing card games at 12 noon. Young students making beelines near local food carts, selling egg rolls and greasy chicken chow mein. And overflowing side drains choking with stale scales of fish, rotting vegetable peels and leftover rice. 
The old houses, some of them a hundred years old, stand tall, though bent, as reminders of Calcutta's lost glory and heritage. Some of these houses have little banyan trees growing roots inside moss-infected walls. Some others have money plants drooping out of broken stained glass windows. Some houses stand arrogant, distinct from their neighbors, recently repaired and painted in loud, bright, garish shades of strawberry pink or lemon tart yellow. Their insides though are largely the same. Voices whispering in kitchens. The calm routine of salt and sea smelling smoke coming out of exhausts. Unassuming rooms with the plaster falling off in places. Narrow, steep stairs leading up to an open terrace. Red cemented floors on which people still sit cross-legged to eat their large meals. Calendars of Kali or Krishna smirking from pegs hammered into arbitrarily chosen spots on the walls. Four poster beds with mosquito nets or soft side pillows. Gray sweat-stained curtains. An infinitely patient, infinitely proud, infinitely suffering faces. Calcutta is aware of all my firsts. The first love letter, still unsent. The first poem, still unpublished. The first dream, still unrealized. The first kiss at Eden Gardens, under a light drizzle, standing behind a row of otoshi bushes with drunk fireflies for company, fluttering their Tinkerbell wings relentlessly, restlessly, maddeningly, in that dot of a moment, I had felt infinite. I had convinced myself that love is forever. But Calcutta knows better. Calcutta knows not only of my very first kiss, but of the several first kisses with the several people that came and went later. I left Calcutta at a time when the city had nothing else to offer me, returning annually for three weeks to get healed or for lessons in humility. When I feel young, confident, beautiful, I choose places like Manhattan, South Delhi, West London, the list of reasons to leave Calcutta is endlessly long when you're growing up. The list of reasons to love Calcutta catches you by surprise by raising its hesitant head when you have grown up, when your heart has flown from mountain to sea to city to person, when you're weary of chasing fame and failure and you long to be home. I am home. I have been here for the last eight months now, and Calcutta has accepted me with a warmth I've known nowhere else. It is easy to fall in pace and in love with the excruciatingly slow, relaxed, complacent life the city offers. Is it healthy though? I'll never know. But what I do know is that life cannot be too bad as long as I can take a ferry from Bhagbajar Ghat at sunset and set sail down the Ganges with nowhere in particular to go and no one in particular to meet. Um, a couple of short ones, maybe, um, written over the last few months. This is um, from the work that I'm um, presently um, working on, editing, etc. Uh, this one is called your old curio shop. Your old curio shop. I know a thing or two about home. Home leaving felt safer than homecoming on most nights. You were an empty city when I first arrived at your doors. The ghosts of your empty memories had taken the last empty train to go back to their empty nowheres. Do not touch, read the label. Look at his bright from light years away. But I don't take instructions too well. Always flying dangerously close to the sun, stealing fire from the stars. You invited me into your old curio shop. 
tucked away in the bylanes of your heart. I walked from shelf to shelf, skin to burn, to flesh to breath, stumbled, tri tripped, danced. Your walls echoed my song. You will burn, you will burn, read the statutory sign. But how do you stop lovesick birds from singing in the rain or building safe nests in old curio shops? This next one mm, is situated here and there. It's called um, Eating a Mango in Calcutta. The Irish nun in finishing school taught me how to eat a mango in summer. Knife, fork, tip of my forefinger, thumb. But some women come from a different soil. They eat with hands, mouths, eyes. My mother, my mother's mother, my mother's mother's mother, women wild, women fertile, women who dared to laugh, bleed, wear red. It is not eating, they said, until you've plucked the fruit, spat out seeds, spilled the juice, sucked it dry. You cannot eat ripe mangoes on hot afternoons in Calcutta without sweating. For eating is a verb, a metaphor that can birth love. So um, how are we doing for time, Brooke? Uh, do we have, okay, all right. Maybe um, another, All right, um, okay, maybe this one. Um, this is actually um, something I wrote when I was living on the East Coast. Um, so going to lay bare my wee, young, confused heart before you, um, before we hear from Danielle. This is from a couple of years ago and still makes me a little shy. This is called The Girl on the Phone. I was walking home late last night down the cobbled streets of the sour, whiskey-smelling south side of New York City. I'd watched a Colombian movie, Spanish with English subs, Mamo, about an estranged mother and a daughter and a daughter's daughter, and how the three briefly find love, comfort, and solace in one another. The girl walking ahead of me on the footpath was on the phone crying and every four or five sentences repeating, how can you do this to me? How can you leave me alone? Now, I love people who are unafraid to get drunk. I love sitting down with them and hearing their drunk stories. There is an honesty in their tears, a vulnerability in their lies, an indiscretion in their warmth and abandon that even the best of us have to fake in our best composed moments. And so I followed the slightly drunk, deeply disturbed girl until I had to cross the road and walk over to the other side. Have I really been able to go over to the other side? I thought of my last two breakdowns in the last couple of years. The letters that I had written had come back unanswered, all 61 of them. I seemed to have sent them to a wrong address. In my late teens and early 20s, I never cried when the men came and went. I was confident and brave and uncaring. I had the kind of arrogance that comes with youth. They could leave, but I knew they would come back someday. And even if they didn't, others would. But by the time I started approaching 30, I lost that faith in them and in me. And so I cried the last two times that they left on the phone, like that girl repeating, how can you do this to me? How can you leave me alone? 
I wanted to stop the girl on the road and shake her up and say, we need to be young again. We need to be shameless, reckless, brave, and hopeful. There are too many of us unseeing the dreams we had once dared to chase. I wanted to tell the girl that I too had cried on the phone, but they had left anyway. They were meant to leave anyway. I had cried and begged and pleaded with them to stay, but you cannot make people stay when they're determined to go away. My love for them had been hypothetical, assumptions based on insufficient evidence. I wanted to tell the girl that in the last few months that I've been alone, I did not regret that they had gone. What I regret is that I had humbled myself for them. To love and not be loved in return is fucking brutal. I wanted to tell her there is no beauty in fighting madly, maniacally for love where there is none because some things look good only in the movies. In life, they tend to bring hurt and humiliation. I wanted to tell the girl she needs to apologize to herself on behalf of all those who had not. If a sorry is what you're waiting for, let me tell you it will not come. If a sorry will help you move on, say a sorry to yourself, the one they won't say, and do move on. I wanted to tell the girl of the sex worker whom I had met on the streets of London at 4 a.m. when I was sitting on a park bench outside my hotel in Kensington, crying and singing on the phone. Dhari dhari, mone kori. Dhar te gelem, har pelem na dhari dhari, mone kori. Dhar te gelem, har pelem na dekhe chhi. I tried and I tried to get you, but you were always just a little out of my reach, just a little too gone. Take your time to get over, Katerina Vasilieva, the legal sex worker from Budapest in London, had told me in broken English, there is no rush to forget anything she had said. But when you do move on, when you do forget, make sure it's absolutely clean with no dirty traces left. I wanted to stop the girl and tell her there is no point in asking how some people live with themselves after damaging others' homes. I wanted to tell her that what follows those phone calls to unwilling lovers is regret. I regret that I had cried and begged and pleaded with them to say, I regret that my mother never taught me how to live by myself and how my father and my sister and my neighbor and my God and my dog and my cat all always spoke of adjustments and compromises and friendships and love, prescriptions to a happy life surrounded by family and friends. There was no prescription on how to make it on my own on how to watch a movie all by myself alone in a theater full of people, on how to order for a three course or a two course or a one course or any meal at all for myself in a restaurant alone, surrounded by cheer and laughter and whispered promises and sweet kisses, on how to go to a flea market or a park or a picnic on a Sunday afternoon alone, on how to live by myself on my own alone. I wish I could tell the girl the person she was on the phone with would leave anyway. I wish I could tell her, you are not an Airbnb room sister where the men can come and go. Your body will not be their holiday destination, their weekend getaway, their staycation. You are worth more. I wish I could share with her the prescription on how to make it on her own. But by the time I got the medication, that girl was long gone. Thank you. Um, I do have an eye on the time. So um, I'll keep it at that. Thank you so much for listening. And I'd love to hear Danielle read now. Oh, so Rita, thank you. My last poem is that I love the vulnerability and at the same time, the invulnerability and spellbinding quality of it. It's really beautiful. 
So I, like you, will begin with an Emily Dickinson poem, one of my favorites, which, uh, whose first line is, the brain is wider than the sky. Can you hear me? The brain is wider than the sky. For, put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea. For, hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the heft of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. Emily Dickinson. I just, I love the poem for its, um, its praising of the, the capacity of the mind to perceive, to make, um, to imagine the world, uh, which makes us godlike or makes us like a greater creator. So I love this poem. Still life with orbs. Between the thing and the name of it is a world, and a world behind this world. There is my mask placed on the table. There is the wooden table and the space beneath it. There is an orange on the floor when it should be on the table in the yellow basket meant for oranges, but which contains a cat licking one front paw. What do cats know of oranges? What do birds know of water unless they plunge their beaks into it, breaking some poor fish's sleep? What do fish know of birds, except the slash of bill, the sudden flash, the stop. So I'll read now from um, these, new, these new poems I've been writing about the um, Haitian migrant experience. And it's entitled, Let Them Walk. This is very, very new work. And um, it's, it's in sections, so I'll pause after each section. I had no mother. I had no father. I had a need tied to a cord by a ball of flame. I ran. When the running could sear no more, when the horse of my body stopped, I walked. Nights of unspeakable stars shook nature of my blood through green reeds of a river bottom. Plumes into silty ink. Still, how cells will call to cells, ancestor to the current. I move through you. I move through you. There is only forward. The thing at your back, you already know. Door and don't. Gully, catacomb, effluvium, anali, onward, defying the blinding portal. How sweet could be this bed of mud, this rest of marrow, bone, if one said no. Weight on the head, weight on the back, arms of everything, tassels and rope, burden of freedom, burning. Weight on the head, weight on the back, My cousin said, come, 
My husband said, come. The plantation owners said, come. The factory bosses said, come. I move through you. I move through you. They said you'll find life as if life were a person you'd meet on the street, set of keys clinking against a back pocket, as if life were a god returned from a bath, pulling the blinds up to whisper the names of three countries. The wind erases all borders. The Darien Gap, ligature of Colombia and Panama, where South and Central meet, mapless jungle, America, America, soaring canopy. The pain is more than me. The pain is more than me. What falls from the trees falls first from the sky. Some pray, some say a curse unfurls the day they arrive. Some fall, some slip, some remain steadfast. Some move quickly, some gravely, some like the river rumbling through. Some glad to see themselves in the chopped reflections of small waves some grammatically correct, some with the tongues of wrecks parsing the language of uprootings, the schemas of arrival, some crash through the brush, some sting, some get stung, entangled, some sing, begin again the chorus solo, Nights of nothing but rain, steam of pre-dawns, fog of green dawn. The provisions last only so long. The provision of the mind stretching the visions and sliding gates of schools, of supermarkets, their mechanical eyes, their cool air, rows of the soul's repair, open. They said, don't come. There is nothing for you here. They said, let me be clear. The animal self, what the eyes see, buzzing in the head. Ask the coyote, what is the most dangerous animal in these trees? He replies, the mosquito. Are we insects? Are we swarm? Are we compound eyes, one pair of antennae? Are we numbers in the jungle line? Through Ecuador, through Peru, through Colombia, through Panama, through Costa Rica, through Nicaragua, through Honduras, through Guatemala and Mexico. Most Haitians at the southern border have walked through 10 countries to get here. I'm, um, I'm going to read a poem uh, with a, a title that I hope is not going to be too shocking and, <laughs> and which contains some cussing. So uh, trigger warning, you have been forewarned. <laughs> um, uh, I, um, a, a few years ago, our, our president, not the current president, um, became frustrated with lawmakers uh, who wanted to extend protected status to 
uh, immigrants from El Salvador, certain countries in Latin America and South America uh, and Central America, uh, certain African countries and Haiti, uh, uh, who would be especially vulnerable if they were repatriated to their countries. And the president asked, why are we having all these people from shithole countries come here? Uh, and so being from such a, such a country, I felt it was, uh, I, one, I tried to understand the president's perspective, um, just, but only for a minute. Um, but that, uh, that attempt uh, served as a point of departure uh, of, this, of this poem, which is entitled Shithole. I am the interrupter, hijacking your train of thoughts. Call me maldito, cabron, la bestia. Get on top of me and I'll throw you off after you beg. I'll ride you like a borrowed mule, drive you across the river to sell you up it. Call me coyote, call me Wolf, call me whatever the fuck animal you like. Missionary, priest, call me Mr. President. I'm all green, a blue gasp. I'm the womb sterilizer, syringe and suction, the foe of women. I'll drown you in a teaspoon of potassium chloride. I was born an abomination. At the age of one, I crawled out of the Congo, dragging my sack full of hands. At the age of two, I mechanized my scythe. At the age of three, I wove myself a cape of flies. At the age of four, I blew the noses off sphinxes and studied the hieroglyphs of your tomb. At the age of five, I became an angel, cunning, big-eared. At the age of six, I shot down the moon, then I shot down the sun. I am a nuclear bomb set for noon, the paratext of your nightmare, the translator of your tribulation. I am a constipation, the parasite entering your left ear, the worm nestled in your colon, the sweetest, the sweetest, the sweetest liar, the drone of your inner war, the architect of your gas chamber, the poisoner of your water, the multiplier. I am the radioactive sphincter, the unthinkable, intolerable, bleached ass. Um, next poem is entitled Poem for the Poorest Country in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, um, in addition to being called shithole, uh, a shithole country, Haiti has has uh, repeatedly been called the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, particularly in uh, mainstream um, US media. And uh, Haiti absolutely uh, suffers from poverty. There is no question and is going through a very, very difficult time as you, um, as you know, uh, following the news, right? But I got a bit tired of hearing that, that label affixed to Haiti as if it were its only moniker, you know, as if it, if it had not, you know, been the site of uh, the country of the first um, successful, the only successful slave revolt in the world in 1804, you know, um, founder of a black republic, um, the site of, of, of great um, art and artist and so on. Um, so Haiti sort of being drawn in, in just a limited way upset me. So this poem emerged as a, as a response. And, and also one final comment, since I'm on my soapbox here, you know, um, often there isn't a discussion of sort of what, what has impoverished Haiti, Haiti you know, in, including, um, you know, of course, problems with our government, but also international intervention in Haitian affairs. So. Poem for the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. 
Oh, poorest country, this is not your name. You should be called Beacon. You should be called Flame. Almond and Bougainvillea. Garden and Green Mountain. Villa and Hut. Girl with red ribbons in her hair. Books under arm, charmed by the light of morning. Charcoal cellar in black skirt encircled by dead trees. You country, our merchant woman and eager clerk. Grandfather at the gate, at the crossroads, with the flashlight, with all in sight. Watching the time. All right, so my last two poems will be um, from my most recent book, um, translations of the poems of Ida Faubert. And um, I'm really happy with this book because uh, the cover certainly, because the, the painting is done by a, a wonderful um, Haitian American painter, Colette Brésila. And then the, the, the design of the book was done by a Leslie graduate student who was a graphic designer, Roxanne Kamanyag. So just was happy for this collaboration, this woman collaboration. Um, and so I will read to you uh, two poems. Uh, well, at the original uh, poem by Ida Faubert, she was a Haitian French poet writing in the early part of the 20th century, living both in Paris and primarily in Paris, but then also um, sometimes in, in Port-au-Prince and um, really uh, not sort of taking on the tropes assigned to women of colors, especially in the European imagination. So, and, and also she writes these beautiful love poems. So I'm going to end with a, a beautiful love poem um, by Ida Faubert. I'll read to you the uh, French original so that you can hear her beautiful um, rhymes and rhythms. Um, and, uh, and then I will read to you my uh, English translation. The poem is entitled Soir Tropical or Tropical Night. Soir Tropical. Le soir est lumineux, le soir est tendre et beau. Le soleil s'atteinte, la lune est sur les roses. Une longueur pénètre au cœur même des choses. Les grands palmiers noirs rêvent au bord de l'eau. Les jasmins ont mêlé leurs branches étoilées aux lianes en fleurs. La laine de l'été caresse les fruits lourds. La grave volupté laisse traîner son voile au détour des allées. Là-bas, sur le chemin, pas un chant, pas un bruit. Rien ne trouble la paix d'un bonheur qu'on écoute. Viens sentir les parfums sur le bord de la route et respirer mon âme et passe dans la nuit. Tropical Night The night is luminous. The night is tender and beautiful. The sun has obscured itself. The moon rests on the roses. A languor enters the very heart of things. The tall black palms dream at the water's edge. The jasmine have mixed their star-studded branches with lianas in bloom. Summer's breath caresses the heavy fruit. The dense sensuality lets its long veil linger along the sinuous paths. Over there, on the way, not a song, not a sound. Nothing disturbs the peace of a joy we listen to. Come, take in the fragrances at the road's edge and breathe in my soul spread across the night. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you, Samrita. Um, I have the great pleasure of being able to audibly applaud for you. So I, I will. Um, those were absolutely lush and, and rich and beautiful readings. And um, I loved how different they were and, and also how um, 
certain thematic connections really came through very strongly for me. We have just a few remaining minutes together. Um, and I do want to make sure that we get to ask you a question or two. Um, we may go just a few minutes past the hour, if that's all right, um, Danielle and Sonrita, just a few, just a couple minutes past. Okay. That should give us a little bit of time for a question or two. If anyone has a really burning question, feel free to throw it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start us off because I really was feeling those um, themes of geography and belonging. And um, Emily Dickinson is someone who wrote that she sees New Englandly. She said, "I see New Englandly." But, and no doubt her experience um, of her New England home really inspires her work. But just as often it seems as she writes about her New England home, she's also deriving great meaning from places she's never been, sites she's never seen. And she co-opts these places, these views, these, these places um, for her poetic purpose. And the, uh, there's a favorite example of this, I think, which is Volcanoes Be in Sicily. It's very short, so I'll read it. Volcanoes be in Sicily and South America. I judge from my geography, volcano nearer here. A lava step at any time, am I inclined to climb? A crater I may contemplate, Vesuvius at home. So tonight you both gave us these incredibly rich readings um, largely, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but largely I think about, they, you know, they were filled with imagery and history of, of places that you know intimately, um, whether that was Calcutta or Haiti, and maybe some too that you, that you don't know as intimately, like the interior life of a, of a cat <laughs> um, or a stranger. Um, but I guess I'm, I would love to hear you both speak to what it is that you think are the kind of poetic opportunities or, or perhaps pitfalls um, when you're writing about known or imagined geographies, um, or to use a, another Dickinson term, latitudes of home. What are the latitudes of home? I feel there are challenges in, in, in each, writing about home and writing about the unknown or the other, if you will, right? Um, the, the danger of, of writing about home is that we're sometimes we're so close to it, we can't see it in, in its most rich or um, uh, in, its mo in its richness, right? In, in its truth. Uh, and then of course the danger um, sometimes of writing um, the other is that we may filter a sense of the, the the unknown through all of what we know, right? Um, but I th I think um, I think you know art making involves sort of reaching out, right? Going going beyond the self, uh, as Dickinson has done, um, to attempt a I don't want to say universal experience, but to attempt a a an ultimately human experience. Um, so I think that's part of the, the project. Uh, and so the, those are my opening statements in response to your very, very good um, question. Thank you so much for that question. And also just that beautiful phrase, latitudes of home. Um, what are the latitudes of home? You know, I will echo what Danielle has said. I think there are, you know, pitfalls to challenges to writing about a place that you think you know intimately, just as there might be dangers of trying to imagine a place that you've never uh, been in before. Um, I write, you know, I write about, um, more than home per se, I think I write about memories of home because all of these poems that I've written about places have been after I've left those places. So for me, you know, home is not just about this physical space where I am in presently, it's also about uh, what we leave behind. Um, it's about the people and the places we return to. Um, home is also, you know, um, it's about who we are looking for in people and places. And um, 
You know, I think to that extent, I think um, uh, human stories, stories about places, stories about homes are truly transnational. You could be, because, you know, whether we're trying to fight governments or we're looking for love, I think the human experience is largely, is essentially the same at the core. And um, I think that is how, again, not to use sort of the phrase um, universal, but I think that's how we're able to establish a connection with people, um, with our readers, with other poets, with this community around the world. Thank you for those. Those are beautiful responses. Um, we did have a question from the audience, which I'm gonna combine um, with a question I also had. So um, each of you, in addition to being stunning poets, are also translators of other writings. So Samrita, I know you translate from Bangla and Hindi to English, Danielle from French to English, and maybe other languages too. I might, I might not have got it all there. Um, so I, I would love to know more about how you came to do that work. Um, Karen in the audience wants to know, um, you know, how what do you do you kind of lean towards literal or imagery um, in, in the work of translation? How do you um, I might phrase that too as like, how do you preserve the uniqueness of an original text? But what what calls you? Because there's a creative element of translation work too. So what calls you as a poet to that work? So Marita, I'll, I'll let this one first. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, um, it's really, it's really interesting that we get to talk about this a little bit today, especially because this is a poetry reading series, because, you know, something that we hear very often is that poetry is lost in translation. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to call BS on that because I don't think poetry is lost in translation. I think poetry is translation um, of our feelings into thoughts, thoughts into words, words into um, that ink on paper. So I don't quite subscribe to the idea that poetry is lost in translation. I don't think we're, um, I think I, I like to see translation as a way of gaining. Um, as a way of entering into cultures that I would otherwise never have had any access to. So, you know, I'm really, really grateful to all the translators around the world. I mean, I grew up reading Russian literature without realizing that it was not written in English. It was, after all, written in Russian. Um, Gregory Robasa, for example, I would never have had access probably to Gabriel Garcia Marquez without Robasa. Um, I entered into translation um, accidentally, um, <laughs> like very many other people. In when you're living in a country like India, which is a, you know, melting uh, pot of sorts, you are constantly translating without realizing it, on an everyday basis. But then I also started translating professionally because um, I sort of have a fraught relationship with Bangla which should have been my mother tongue, but it's a language that I learned later in life, much later. So, you know, you could say I was, you know, I was not born into my mother tongue. I arrived at it later. And I decided to translate for readers like me who might not have had access to this language when they were growing up. And there are very many people like that in India at this point in time because English is, um, of late, it's become a first language for a burgeoning section of middle and upper middle class people in the country. So people are losing languages. That's how I entered into translation. Um, um, you know, and the, the philosophy that I like to, my guiding philosophy when I translate is that I'm not looking for equality in the text. The translation will never be equal to the source language text because no two language systems and no two cultures are equal. So what I look for in my translations, through my translations is, um, a sense of equivalence. Um, and I think that has been, for me, it's a, it's, it's a truly humbling experience as well to constantly know that people will probably be saying that I'm falling short, but 
to keep pushing until I feel I've been able to uh, capture the essence of the source language into the language that I'm translating. Oh, I so appreciate the comments about uh, because I mean, we're all uh, we we all many of us most of us have language right and we use it uh, um, on a daily basis but then poetry is this other kind of language and so I think translation is a really nice um, definition I was going to say metaphor but definition uh, um, uh, of poetry. Um, I feel that languages carry whole whole world views, um, and and I and I feel that it's a it's it's wonderful to to be able to access as many of those world views uh, as we can. Um, uh, you know, where would we be? I think I think we we often don't think about where we would be as as readers and thinkers and cultures without the work of translation. Some of our most important texts, texts that have deeply informed our cultures, like the Bible, for example, right? Or the Bhagavad Gita, or the Quran. I mean, all of these texts come to us from, you know, through translation. Um, and so, um, so translation, I think, is an integral part of our, of our, of our cultural, you know, artistic, political life. Um, um, so, I, so um, just to underscore, you know, why I feel translation is important uh, and important to uh, engage in and important to consume. Uh, I, uh, what just called me to this work? Uh, I, um, I'm an immigrant and so I feel I've always been interpreting you know, moving between language systems in just my daily life. So it's not the idea of, of, of co, well, uh, of translation, of interpretation and code switching, code, code switching, code meshing is not unfamiliar to me. But I also think that, that even if we, even if someone doesn't have, doesn't speak two different foreign, different languages, I mean, we engage in kinds of code switching and code meshing, um, uh, uh, in, in, in our lives, going between cu cultures within cultures in the United States, for example, I think involves some translation. Uh, back to the question of what called me to the work. Um, what called me to this, to the work that this Ida Fobert text is, um, has to do with wanting to make her work more um, accessi accessible to scholars and students of Haitian literature in particular. She's a Haitian writer and Caribbean literature and Caribbean women's literature um, in, in general. And, you know, with, with this text um, and my first book, this is my first book of translations, I stayed close to the text. If, and now I'm working on a second translation project, I think I'm gonna lift off a little bit, give myself a little bit more um, space um, to, um, to capture what I feel is the spirit of the of this text. So I think the spirit of the text, and I think Samrita spoke to this a little bit, is really, really important, or understanding what, what the essence of the text is um, to, to bring it into the host language. Long-winded, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, that's, that was, those were both such generous and, and um, really, um, uh, insightful and deep answers to that question. Thank you so much. I think um, since we are over time, I, I do have to draw us to a close. I have a feeling that we could keep on chatting all night um, with Danielle and Samrita, who uh, have just been such an amazing pairing tonight. Um, I want to really thank each of you, Danielle Legro george Samrita Ganguly, uh, for being with us. Um, I want to thank you too, our listeners, um, for sharing your time and, and your wonderful words of appreciation in the chat. I'll be sure to share those with Danielle and Samrita after this so that they can read them. Um, these wonderful authors have books, and you should definitely go buy them. Um, they are available at your nearest independent bookseller. Um, I'm going to put in the link um, the, uh, oops, sorry. Whoop.
I am going to put into the chat, there we go, a link to the bookseller for the phosphorescence book, uh, uh, phosphorescence poetry reading series. So you can check them out there. Um, the hour always feels like it flies by, but we do have more virtual poetry coming up for you all next month when our featured phosphorescence poets are Rosemary Dombrowski and Rezi Ibanez, who I believe is here tonight. Hello, Rezi. Great to see you. Um, so be sure to check out um, the websites for Sorita and Danielle as well. I'm going to put those in the chat too before we leave. Um, and be sure to check out the Emily Dickinson Museum's website where you can sign up for our monthly mailing list. Can learn more about our programs you can make a donation in support of free events like this one um, and we just in general hope that you will keep in touch and uh that we will see you again and so marita danielle thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure thank you Brooke. thank you so much bro for hosting us take care everyone be well take good care of yourselves i'm putting websites in the chat again as we speak a lot of love for you all in the chat. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that's tuned in. I'm so sorry. I actually missed the chat box, but uh, thanks, Brooke. We will, I think, get to um, go through this. And please feel free to stay in touch with us yeah. and the museum. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll let you get to bed so Rita. <laughs> 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 I hope that you can sleep in a little bit. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. All right. This is so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much once again. All right. Take care, you two. See you soon, I hope. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>